I am Raya Radwan, a Palestinian activist. I am the media and campaigns coordinator at Stop the Wall, a grassroots organization that is based on the occupied West Bank. I'm co-facilitating today's conversation with Jessica from Visualizing Palestine. World Without Walls campaign was initiated in 2017 by Palestinian and Mexican organizations, as we believe that walls are monuments of expulsion, exclusion, oppression, discrimination, and exploitation. Walls have not only risen to fortify borders of state control, but democrate the boundaries between the rich, the powerful, the socially acceptable, and the others. Despite the fact that the International Court of Justice in 2014 confirmed the illegality of the Israeli apartheid wall, which was built in 2002, and instead of Israel tearing down its walls, the model was normalized and spread. Today, some 70 walls are built to, mil to militarize borders and impose state control of occupied across the globe. Intention of bringing together movements across the globe fight these walls. World Without Walls has developed from an annual day of interaction, November 9, to also be a space of encounter to build connections between movements struggling against walls. This year, at the COP27, the true builders of walls of climate colonialism are meeting to mount false solutions in front of us and bar, bar the path towards climate justice. And here comes the aim of our conversation today. My comrade Jessica will tell you more about this. Thank you, Raya. My name is Jessica, and I am Deputy Director with Visualizing Palestine. There's multiple mobilizations, um, diverse mobilizations that have been happening around COP and uh, COP27 climate conference, and we're excited to be providing one space today in collaboration with Stop the Wall to look at Palestinians' experience, you know, just a few hundred kilometers away from where this conference is taking place. Um, in the context of, so their experience in the context of Israeli settler colonialism and apartheid, and how their experience confronting false solutions in that context is interconnected with the experiences of so many other communities around the world. So these are some of the things we hope to explore today. And I want to say before we introduce our speakers in a moment, a special thanks to all of our co-sponsors for this event. That's Adala Justice Project in the US, the African Water Justice Network, Al Haq in Palestine, Arab Resource and Organizing Center or ARAC in the US, Assemblea El Argarobo in Argentina, BOCAP's Finest in South Africa, the BDS National Committee in Palestine, Grassroots Global Justice Alliance in the US, Jewish Voice for Peace in the US, the North African Network for Food Sovereignty. Observatorio de Derechos Humanos de los Pueblos in Mexico, Pan-African Palestine Solidarity Network, the South African BDS Coalition, U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights in the USA. And I want to just specially shout out um, U.S. Campaign for hosting us on their Zoom today. Thank you so much for helping us set this up. Back to you, Raya. Statement of... Uh, I'm sharing with you a statement of solidarity with the Egyptian political prisoner from Palestinian organizations. As you all know, Ala Abdel Fattah drank his last glass of water in an Egyptian prisoner. If not released, Ala will die before the end of COP27. We are now sharing the, the speakers who are joining us in, this, in today's meeting. So we have Rafat Abu Ayesh. Rafat is from Hirak and Naqab. He's an activist from uh, an Naqab, south of occupied Palestine. He's a writer and educator. Monica Vargas is a Barcelona-based activist and researcher who helps develop and implement Grain's global program. Grain is an international nonprofit organization that supports small farmers and social movements in their struggles for community-controlled and biodiversity-based food systems. 
Monica's main focus has been on the impacts of transnational corporations and free trade agreements, ecological debt, and food sovereignty in the global south. Anna Chiley is a member of Assembly of the Algarbo, Algarbo uh, from Catamarca, Argentina, a self-managed organization that brings together neighbors in defense, in defense of water and territory. Elena Jerabitsa is a researcher and campaigner for ReCommon since 2012. She focuses on campaigns against the expansion of fossil fuels and large-scale infrastructure for over 15 years. Uh, sorry, ReCommon is a collective and an Italian non-for-profit organization. It conducts investigations and promotes campaigns that challenge corporate and state power responsible for the plunder of territories and works to create spaces for change in society. Aborva is the Asia Pacific coordinator for the Palestinian led boycott, divestment and sanctions national committee. She's based in India and is a fellow traveler in contemporary local feminist and social justice struggles as well. Roshan Dadu is a longstanding activist and the current national coordinator of the South African BDS coalition. Uh, Ramon Mijeya. Uh, of Dallas, Texas, is an anti-war veteran and anti-militarism national organizer at Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, where he supports members organizing to dismantle systems of violence to build healthy, thriving communities. We will have two rounds of contributions from our speakers today. The first round is inspired by the question, what interconnections do you see between your struggle in your region and Palestine? Monica from Drain uh, will talk about farms, arms, and Israeli agro-diplomacy. Thanks a lot, Raya, Jessica, and all for the invitation. What I've been asked to is to, uh, to present the, the, the report that the Green has just launched, which is called Farms, Arms and Israel Agro-Diplomacy. And uh, the main objective of this report is to deepen the, the understanding on Israeli agribusiness companies, particularly the less loan, and also to, to see which are the consequences of their operations, uh, both in the global south, but also in the ongoing occupation of Palestinian uh, lands. No? And perhaps to say that this report is a collective work and uh, we are really grateful to the ULWC, to Job Exclusive from Angola, to the BDS movement from several regions actually, to Stop the Wall, Pengon, Who Profits and several journalists from, from different countries among others, which support has been very, really fundamental, but of course the, the contents and the, are the responsibility of grain. You know? um, in this table, you can see the largest Israeli agribusiness corporations uh, with activities in the global south, both, and also in the occupied territories. No? And um, perhaps I would say that uh, three comments on that table that you, where, where you, you can see those corporations. Uh, first of all, that in the last two decades, several of those companies have been integrated into large global corporations. You can see that, for example- you Wait one second. We have a problem with the Spanish yes. interpretation. Oh, sorry for that. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So in this table, you can see, for example, Adama, which is owned by the Central Tech Group, or Hazira in the seed sector, which is owned by Gobli Magan Holding. No? So just that first comment that those companies are, have been integrated into, into global, uh, large global corporations. No? A second comment would be that, for example, on Netafim, that you can see here, that is owned by the or Mexican of the advanced corporations since 2018, uh, in the film we can say that much, much of its sales are conducted through a subsidiary in the Netherlands. And through this setup, and this is very important, Netafin can not only have access to preferential uh, markets overseas through the European Union trade agreements, uh, even markets that have uh, restrictions on trade with Israeli companies, but Netafin can also get financial support from Dutch public agencies, export credit agencies, et cetera, no? Um, and another comment would be that um, you re we really need to, to think about those companies about being in the front lines of industrial agriculture expansion, no? For example, Adama is uh, present in the soybean plantations in Brazil, or uh, Rivulis uh, in the irrigation sector 
is present in, in what is called a, an environmental hell in Mexico, that is the Mexican state of Guanajuato, uh, where most of the fruit and vegetable uh, is exported to the US. No? Um, in the report, we refer to an agro-military complex, no? because uh, Israeli agribusiness companies have really been shaped by the apartheid context no? and continue to profit from it. But the Israeli military is also a very important source of personnel and technologies for those companies, as well as for hundreds of agri-tech startups that are, exist today. And at, as it has been documented, for example, by, uh, by who profits, no? military technology has been adapted to civilian agricultural use in the case of Netafim. But uh, there is more. Uh, the connection between the Israeli agribusiness companies and its military extends well beyond the, the, the borders of Israel. No? For example, India has become both uh, Israel's main arms recipient from 2017 to 2021, and at the same time, a top destination for several Israeli agribusiness companies and irrigation specialists. No? Another example is Vietnam, uh, which has emerged as a major uh, buyer of um, Israeli arms and surveillance technologies. And at the same time, there are several bil bilateral agricultural projects with Israel. No? This includes uh, Israel's commitment to invest $100, $100 million into a mega dairy farm, uh, which is, has been constructed by Afimilk, which is another Israeli company. No? And you can see that the same for Angola, for example, uh, the Philippines, South Sudan, uh, Azerbaijan, and other countries that, that are strategic in ge geopolitical terms for Israel, where we notice that the sale of Israeli uh, military equipment and security systems often overlaps with the sale of agricultural uh, technologies. And in the report, we also talk about agro-mercenaries no? in, uh, into large-scale turnkey projects. And this is because we have noticed there is a tendency of uh, some of those companies, in particularly, particularly the, the ones that are less known, you know, to engage in problematic large-scale turnkey projects, and that in the, in the last years in the Global South. And we have seen some common steps that you can uh, see in the, in the slide. We have uh, divided that in like five steps, uh, which uh, we found as a pattern. Of course, not always the same, but it, it usually happens like that. So first of all, you would have a meeting between the Israeli company representatives and high level politicians from a country which is usually rich in natural resources. And the company would propose uh, a multimillionaire uh, dollar agricultural projects equipped with um, the latest Israeli technologies. And the company uh, offers to handle everything from getting the loans to constructing the farms or the, the project and to managing the project also. You know? That's step one. In step two, uh, while the agricultural component is uh, the public face of the project, the real pitch is the financing, in our view, no? Um, because those projects often happen in, uh, what are in deals with governments that have difficulties getting credit. So the, through the agricultural project, those companies are able to secure hundreds of millions of dollars in financing from European and Israeli banks and export credit agencies uh, that are often rooted through the Israeli companies offshore subsidiaries. No? And step three, the government that is hosting the project uh, but must guarantee the loans, in some cases uh, by the sale of natural resources. And uh, the government makes available lands uh, for the project, even if this causes the displacement of local communities. And then in step four, the top-down project, often called village farm, following the model of the Moshav, uh, is built. And in the Global South, those projects, we, we, we really saw them as top down because local communities are excluded from the decision making process. And also they become dependent on the import of Israeli technologies like greenhouses, hybrid seeds, uh, or irrigation technologies. No? And the participant villagers are more likely cheap labor for the company, as we have seen in cases like Aldeia Nova in Angola, for example. No? Um, and finally, the project eventually collapses you know, once the lo loan money is used up. Actually, many of those, uh, those projects uh, don't appear to be adapted to the local conditions and cannot be sustained without new inflows of money. But when it collapses, the Global South government still has to, to deal with the debt, you know, uh, even if there are uh, signs of possible corruption. You know? um, in this uh, infographic, um, perhaps I will, I will uh, 
give me one second. Perhaps we can see it better here. We have uh, illustrated some of those uh, projects um, in Africa, but uh, it's important to, to say that this happens in uh, also in other regions like Latin America or Asia. I, I will perhaps make it bigger. We have uh, been working on groups that uh, that are really less known, like the LR group, for example, or Green Thousand, that is also based in the Netherlands, no, or um, the Mitrelli, which is very close to the LR group, no. And um, yeah, basically, the, uh, if you if you want afterwards, I can give more information on those uh, projects, and I will leave it here. As I think my my time has run. Thank you, Monica. Thank you so much. This is really interesting, and I've shared a link um, in the chat to read more about the Farms Arms and Israel's Agro Diplomacy report. Uh, next, we would like to invite Anna Cheli to speak about the campaign against Mekarot in Argentina. Okay, it seems like Anna might be having some connection issues, so hopefully we can come back um, but in the meantime, I'll invite Elena, if, if you can hear me okay, if you could speak about the East Med Mediterranean pipeline and gas expansion. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so thank you everyone for being here and uh, thank you for organizing this, uh, this event. Um, <clears throat> I was asked uh, to talk about um, gas expansion in East Mediterranean and uh, one of the new uh, <clears throat> large infrastructure for the export of gas from the region to, to Europe, uh, which is the East Mediterranean gas pipeline. So <clears throat> if I want to connect uh, like uh, the struggles in Europe against uh, the expansion of gas, and those uh, in the region, in particular um, in Palestine, <clears throat> I must say that uh, uh, the EU dependency on gas is actually one of the main drivers for gas expansion um, in the Mediterranean region, but also elsewhere uh, globally. So uh, even though uh, like um, through the years, uh, um, the European governments and member states, they've been talking about phasing out from gas. The truth is that uh, the industry um, is uh, very much uh, <clears throat> influential on, uh, on the member states, on the European institutions. And so de facto, if we are looking at what is happening even more in the context of the of the ongoing war between uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, the, um, the gas expansion has been relaunched. So uh, one of the uh, areas where we have the biggest uh, non-explored gas reserves uh, is the East Mediterranean. In particular, um, like since the basically uh, 2010, when the Leviathan gas field was discovered in, uh, in Israel, and then uh, the Zor gas field was discovered in, um, in Egypt uh, offshore, uh, we have seen an expansion of e exploration and extraction in the region. Just to give you some numbers, uh, there are <clears throat> about uh, estimated 3.5 trillion cubic meters uh, of gas in the eastern Mediterranean uh, waters. And uh, only five, in, in five uh, big fields, uh, there are about uh, half of these uh, reserves. These fields are all being uh, uh, explored. And uh, some, uh, like uh, in some of the, of the blocks, uh, the exploration is continuing, but the five main ones that are being also uh, operational uh, in, in this moment are the Leviathan and Tamar in, uh, in Israel, uh, Aphrodite and Calypso in, uh, in Cyprus, and uh, Zor in uh, Egypt. So this is just to give you a figure. And uh, the European Union has been pushing a lot for the expansion of, uh, of the extraction. Uh, in, in East Mediterranean, and 
one of the uh, one of the uh, mega projects that has been uh, uh, proposed many years ago, but uh, and uh, but was never really um, like uh, uh, having the political but also the financial support to move ahead is the East Med pipeline. Uh, with the, within the context of uh, the European response to, to the war uh, and uh, to this uh, so-called need to find uh, alternative uh, sources of gas uh, that are um, kind of able to uh, support uh, member states to move away from, uh, from Russia. Uh, the uh, the Repower EU uh, package of legislation basically relaunched also the possibility of building this pipeline. We talk about uh, a project that is 1,900 kilometers long. It may cost around uh, 6 billion euros. And uh, more than everything, uh, if it will be built, uh, it will uh, uh, lock in uh, every country like in Europe, but also in the region to the extraction and to the dependency from gas. So we see that here there is again a very hypocritical role being played by the European Union, like on one hand being champion for human rights uh, or uh, calling for, uh, you know, addressing uh, climate change. On the other hand, concretely moving ahead with projects that are like uh, just uh, enforcing uh, the existing regimes uh, in the region. Uh, if we look in particular to the apartheid regime in, um, in Palestine, uh, there is no doubt that the Israeli government is being strengthened by the uh, cash that it can make by uh, selling the gas. Since 2020, Israel is selling the gas extracted in Leviathan and Tamar through Egypt. So in this specific moment, the uh, export infrastructure, let's say, are all in Egypt. So this gas is being extracted in Israel offshore and then transported through um, uh, an existing pipeline, the Ari Shashkelon pipeline, connecting uh, Israel and Egypt, bypassing the Gaza Strip. So it's going offshore. And uh, through this uh, infrastructure, Israel is selling, passing uh, through, e through Egypt. Uh, the EU made sure that the gas is going to Europe just because, uh, you know, uh, the, um, uh, when gas is liquefied, it can go anywhere. But in June this year, uh, Europe signed a trilateral agreement with Israel and with Egypt. And uh, uh, the agreement is saying that Europe is encouraging pretty much uh, Israel to sell its gas through Egypt to Europe. So this is just to say that <clears throat> it's very clear like the type of uh, political push. Uh, also, if we want to look into the corporations and uh, finance, uh, all the big uh, oil and gas players are involved in the uh, extraction offshore. Um, also, all the major banks uh, and the major investors uh, are all putting their money into this. So uh, the situation is really, um, uh, how can I say, uh, critical from many, many points of view, uh, but maybe the most uh, um, uh, dangerous one is really the human rights uh, perspective. So we are seeing again that the so-called state of emergency that uh, Europe is uh, uh, using uh, to uh, promote uh, the, the gas agenda is also being used to support, uh, like to give political and economic support to the regimes uh, in place uh, just because uh, of uh, the dependency on gas. So this is really um, uh, making, uh, like adding complexity uh, to an already difficult uh, situation. 
And uh, of course, uh, for all the campaigners uh, and for all the activists uh, that are engaging both on like the anti-apartheid uh, um, uh, campaigns, but also the climate justice campaigns, uh, it's really important to understand how these two aspects are totally interconnected and how we have not only governments, but also corporations and uh, banks uh, that are behind uh, this, uh, this agenda. So I stop here for now and uh, we can continue later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elena. Uh, it was really important to highlight the estimate by blind and gas, gas expansion in East Mediterranean as a climate justice, justice issue. We invite now uh, Anna Chiley to talk about the campaign against Mekarut in Argentina. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, from Asamblea del Garrobo, we want to thank you for the invitation. I'm sorry, she's having a bad connection to talk about what's happening in our country and to uh, tell a little bit of what's going on. In May of this year, the Argentinian government signed a, um, an agreement with the um, enterprise uh, Mekorot, which is the water company of Israel, to uh, create a master plan of um, the integral management of eh, under um, and uh, water sources. The objective of this agreement is to create a plan for a smart management of water. The objective of this plan was to create um, an integral management of the water. With this, what the Argentinian government is saying is that it seeks to guarantee the water supplies for this and uh, next generations, giving the um, scarcity that is being caused by climate change. Yes. Given the time now, uh, five um, province, Argentinian provinces have signed this agreement. All of these provinces have um, big mining uh, processes going on. Also, uh, green hydrogen uh, mining and petroleum and lithium also uh, explosion, um, exploitation. What are we saying from um, grassroots organizations that se viene desarrollando de una manera violenta y compulsiva contra los pueblos? First of all, what we're asking for, we are seeing that um, the government and enterprises are um, um, giving their responsibility to climate change as if this was a natural phenomenon. So a phenomenon that has no response anybody who is responsible. We see that this is hiding the fact that climate change is the product of um, political decisions that are linked to the overconsumption of natural resources. Second of all, we see that water in the discourse of political people is seen as a natural resource, but a commodity. This makes us think of water as a merchandise, as a privilege. For us, water is a common good that belongs to nature and belongs to the people. It belongs to biodiversity. Also, water is a human right, and it has been recognized by uh, UN like this. 
the discourse of um, politicians and enterprise managers says that this master plan of Mekorot Enterprise will contribute to the uh, projects, big impact projects that will diversify um, economic. Extractivism for us is is theft, is contamination. We also have in mind that the extraction project process is based on the use of big um, quantities of water. In 2020, um, Catamarca province declared um, ecological emergency, but also allowed a company to, extract, to use 20,000 uh, liters of water for mining. In our town, a lithium mining project dried a river. We ask who is the water for and who is the water from for um, companies or people. Because in this extractivist model, companies come in and money comes in, but people and communities cannot participate. So we think about what is the relationship between our struggle and the struggle of the Palestinian people. Mekrot has been accused of denying the access to water with discriminatory policies that have to do with the control of the quantity, the quality and the price of water which is allowed or provided to the Palestinian people. So there is a clear violation of the human right to water. These practices were condemned by the Special Rapporteur of the United Nations, and this was not a barrier to the Argentinian government to receive, to go to Israel and to sign the agreement which we are denouncing. So we are asking ourselves, how can the Argentinian government, which has spoken about human rights as a slogan, how have they justified this agreement to a country that is denying the right to water to the Palestinian people? How is this agreement uh, coming to our territory, and I want to leave this question with you. Who is water for, for the people and for nature, for or for companies? Thank you so much, Anna. Now we are inviting Abruva from BDS National Committee, India, to talk about Netafim Mekarut, Kashmir, and the Israeli Centers of Excellence. Hi, can you hear me well? Okay, fabulous. Um, I just realized what's going to be really fascinating is that uh, I'm going to be talking about um, the case of Netafim uh, based on some studies from India, but you're going to see that this is actually looking exactly what Monica was saying. And uh, that's really how connected these realities and these, uh, these struggles are. Uh, so, well, um, uh, India, like it was mentioned that uh, India is now the biggest uh, uh, importer of Israeli arms and agrotech. And this has been uh, the case of last uh, three decades. And India has moved from being a, one of the states uh, leading the non-aligned movement that did not recognize um, Israel and apartheid South Africa uh, to this situation. And uh, one of the early moments of this uh, changing reality were uh, pretty much like the model of turnkey projects that the Grain Report talks about. Uh, was an early project in um, a southwestern state in India in a town called uh, Kupang, uh, where a consortium of Israeli companies, which included Netafim, uh, introduced uh, a similar like um, 
you know, they call it boot, uh, build, operate, transfer uh, contracts uh, for drip irrigation. Um, at the moment, uh, this is a, a time when the local community opposed this uh, contract. Uh, agriculture experts criticized it heavily. Uh, but as so happens that this went on to become the standard model for a lot of uh, uh, agribusiness companies to use in India, uh, but one of the early progenitors of that was, uh, was Netafim as part of a consortium. Uh, today, Netafim uh, do, does much more than that. It is uh, very actively present in all the regions in India where there is where agriculture is aided, there is less water, so they sort of insert themselves in this way of providing sustainable technology uh, within quotes. And, and that's the reason why um, this is very important to talk about this when we talk about false solutions. Uh, so like I said, that they are part of some of the biggest projects uh, across South India mainly. Uh, they're also part of state subsidy schemes. So uh, I don't know if it happens in the same way in other places, but in India, our government buys... Uh, what are very heavy equipments uh, so that uh, you know farm owners can buy them at subsidized prices and uh, to kind of follow this story uh, a little more closely uh, the pds campaign in india they uh, sort of followed the you know from subsidy to farm journey of netfm drip irrigation equipment in a town in south india um, and it showed that while uh, Israel, uh, while Netafim uses its presence in Indian agriculture to greenwash Israel's apartheid and settler colonialism, posturing as a benevolent savior of poor Indian farmers, uh, they could not be further from reality. Indian farmers largely constitute those with small or marginal holdings, um, apart from the vast number of landless workers. Affording drip irrigation tools, even at subsidized cost, is a privilege of the richest farmers. And still, even beyond that, the local NetFM agents informed uh, the study group that four fifth of the earning of the earnings uh, that NetFM makes is through being enlisted on the subsidy scheme. So essentially, Indian public money is going into making uh, this uh, sort of platform for greenwashing Israel's apartheid um, and providing nothing to Indian farmers to Indian communities. There is also Mekarot that has been involved. And like, you know, just as the study um, that Monica mentioned, you will see a lot of memorandums of understanding, you will see a lot of news about it, we are yet to see anything on the ground. But we hear a lot of these words of innovation and modern solutions and leaders, and my favorite is best technology, the vaguest term possible. But all of this is removed from the racist colonial history of Israel. And also it seeped in the neoliberal paradigm of withdrawal of state from agriculture leaving those who produce our food at the mercy of markets in these false solutions. Uh, in, within this framework is also the centers of excellence that came up as a uh, agricultural project collaboration between India and Israel. There are dozens of them across India. Uh, they promote horticulture, um, so they say. Uh, so these are essentially land provided by the Indian Horticulture Ministry, uh, the funding and staffing provided by state horticulture ministries, um, Israeli experts are flown in, uh, some videos are made, put on their Facebook pages. Uh, an average person cannot go to these centers to even ask what's going on. We are yet to see any impact of this on the ground. But one after another, these centers are being opened up. There was one that was opened in 2020 in Assam, which is uh, a region which is notorious for eviction of uh, the minority Bengali Muslim communities. Most recently, two of these centers have been opened uh, in Kashmir. Uh, Kashmir is famous for its horticulture, but it's only now that these centers are being opened and this cannot be removed from the context that in 2019, the Indian government, quite inspired from Israel's uh, settlement policy, the occupied territories uh, sort of uh, rescinded the uh, special status that the region of Kashmir had. And since then, uh, a lot of corporations are entering the region uh, because now they can buy land and use it for uh, corporate purposes. And this is the moment when Israel enters to offer this um, boost to horticulture. And here you see the, the uh, farms, arms, agro-diplomacy story playing out at its best uh, uh, in specifically this context. And, and this entire sort of regime from Netifim to Mekarot um, to the centers of excellence provide the uh, soft side of the uh, of the arms uh, 
purchase and uh, the purchase of Pegasus, the package, uh, the purchase of all kinds of technologies and methodologies of oppression from Israel. And in that sense, India is um, a true partner of, uh, um, today's government is true partner of Israel's uh, apartheid regime. And, uh, but this is, I mean, I've spoken mostly about India because that's a, uh, that's a case we've looked at most closely. But there is enough and more information on the same story uh, being carried out in a number of Asian uh, countries from Azerbaijan, which is surprisingly one of the biggest arms uh, importers. I say surprisingly because it's it's a much smaller country size-wise and population-wise, even compared to India. But they are amongst the biggest in purchasing um, Israeli arms from Philippines to Vietnam to Thailand. Um, and therefore, uh, it's, it's kind of really important to uh, not only un like kind of use this framework of uh, greenwashing and agro diplomacy, but also locate it within the question of uh, false solutions, because um, Israel is one example uh, of a of a long series of uh, multinational companies um, sort of flying in with these kind of very neo-colonial attitudes of helping poor farmers and communities. But what we see always is that this is connected to capital, this is connected to politics, and it is ultimately um, a, a, a root of exploitation of local communities and dispossessing them from their resources to be directed towards uh, corporations and in, and in the case of Israel to greenwash its apartheid. Uh, so I'll pause here from the context of uh, India and greenwashing, and uh, I look forward to the second round to kind of think about how we can build our struggles around these questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Aborva, from the BDS National Committee India. Now we would like to invite to welcome Roshan Dadu from South African BDS Coalition to talk about Israel's water technology in South Africa and water apartheid coalition and the work that the Pan-African Palestinian Solidarity Network is doing regarding Israeli agribusiness. Thanks Roshan. very much. Thank you. And thanks for inviting us. Um, and just in uh, answering the question that was put, what do you, what interconnections do you see between your between your struggle in your region and Palestine? I think in the South African BDS coalition, we see it as one and the same struggle. Um, and you know, uh, many of the things that Apuva has mentioned are exactly playing out both in South Africa. Um, and in the rest of our continents. And so, for example, in South Africa, just a few months ago, we have had so-called Israeli water experts coming on a visit and meeting with our municipalities, where all they're doing is peddling for profits and, as Apuva said, fake solutions to our water crisis. So we're campaigning alongside community water activists in different provinces in South Africa as well as the African water justice networks to expose their false solutions and this myth that Israel is perpetuating that it has all this expertise and this technological know-how um, and they can solve problems all over the world um, and show how the very same companies that are coming here are complicit in perpetrating water apartheid in Palestine. And I can see Comrade Sia is here in the meeting and he's doing amazing work with communities in the Eastern Cape province. And there in many places, there's literally no water provision for poor communities. Yet the problem isn't that there is no water at all. But in that very province, the main uh, city municipality was one that entertains these Israeli experts. Even though it's the communities themselves that know what the problem is, and also know what the solutions are. And it's not this useless, expensive and high tech gadgets made by Israeli startup companies that are supported by the Israeli government and complicit in Palestinian water and land theft. And we also have in South Africa a tomato situation where nearly all tomatoes grown in South Africa are from seedlings brought from a, in, an Israeli company called Hishtel. And Hishtel has two South African headquarters and ZZ2, a South African company that holds the virtual monopoly on tomato growing by seedlings from Hishtel. They, and they really try to keep this under the radar, but we have to expose the fact that in effect, our whole tomato industry in a post-apartheid South Africa directly sends millions of rands to Israel to perpetrate, perpetrate apartheid crimes against Palestinians. 
And so again, in this case, our struggle for food security and our struggle um, for food sovereignty is directly related to solidarity with the Palestinian struggle against apartheid and the violent settler, settler colonialism of Israel. And then quickly, just to move on to our Pan-African Palestine Solidarity Network, we held a meeting recently that exposed the extent of apartheid Israeli agritech and the disastrous consequences of these turnkey projects that have been mentioned by Monica and Apuva on local farmers, not only in India and Asia, but also in Africa. And I can see Comrade Sion is here. Um, he facilitates our Papsan working group on these issues and was a uh, what was one of the people that put together this webinar that brought comrades from all over the continent to look at the ways in which we can combine our, our campaigns and work together to counter and expose this myth of Israeli agritech. Um, and just to mention, I think Sion will also agree that the comrade from Angola very movingly described how these deals made by our governments end up further impoverish impoverishing communities. And as Monica said, apartheid Israeli greenwashes, <laughs> apartheid Israel greenwashes arms and spyware sales to repressive governments on our continent that are then used against us. So again, it's one struggle. Um, just very briefly on COP27, which is hailed being hosted by Egypt as one of the, I think the second African COP. It's another example of how human rights and environmental justice can't be separated was mentioned briefly in the introduction um, that it's not just the lack of substantive agreements and lack of political will at the talk shop that is COP, but it's also the way countries like Egypt, the host of this so-called African COP, use hosting global, global climate meetings to cover up their crimes. In the case, of course, of al Abda Abed El Fattah is an example of a human rights defender and a Palestinian rights activist locked up for years and as we know, undertaking a, a desperate hunger strike to force attention on the gross violations of human rights taking place in Egypt. But they are following exactly the same greenwashing playbook that Israel has spent the last 70 or more years writing. And so again, our struggles here are one and the same with the Palestinian struggle. And just finally, as the South African com community environ environmental activists in South Durban have said in statements, the COP27 is a chance for elites to express solidarity in the face of an ex existential threat that can only be defeated by coordinated action and effective implementation. And that again is bringing together, the, bringing all our struggles together, the Palestinian struggle for against apartheid and for justice and equality is key to all of us being able to challenge these corporate neoliberal companies um, and Israel coming into now in particular focusing on Africa in a big way, it's only gonna make the, our struggles here uh, harder. So I think that was really the <laughs> essence of my answer that it's one struggle. Thanks, and I'll come back of course in the second round. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much Roshan from the South African B BDS coalition. Now we would like to welcome Ramon Mejia from North America to talk about the connection between militarism and climate justice, organizing with communities against militarization. Yes, thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> Again, my name is Ramon Mejia. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I'm an anti-militarism national organizer with Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. Uh, GGJ is a cross-issue frontline internationalist and unapologetically left alliance made up of over 60 member organizations across the country. Um, as part of GGJ, we developed the, the militarized working group where we contribute an analysis of the relationship between militarism and the extractive economy and to deepen that consciousness and messaging with our membership who are deeply committed to critically struggling against uh, US militarism and its various forms. Uh, we understand that militarism is an ideology a way of seeing the world through a martial lens that values force as a means to achieve dominance. Um, as a result of this deeply rooted ideology within the US government and the wider society, uh, militarization is growing, shaping institutions and policies to conform uh, to this ideology, uh, leaving millions of people without access to 
education, housing, and healthcare, all foundational elements in building healthy, uh, vibrant communities. I'm currently here at uh, the COP in Sharm el Sheikh, you know, the, uh, the UNFCCC, uh, you know, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, and it remains captured by the corporate interests of the fossil fuel industry and the global north who are uh, most responsible for climate uh, damage. This year, more than uh, 600 fossil fuel lobbyists, lobbyists uh, attended the COP. That's more than a 25% increase from, uh, from, from last year. Um, we knew that at COP, in uh, Glasgow that the Israeli delegation was second to only to the fossil fuel industry. Um, I think over like 300 uh, Israeli delegates attended the COP in, in, uh, in Glasgow. I think over a thousand delegates came to, uh, to Sharm el-Sheikh. Um, and uh, uh, you know, why is this important is because we know that uh, billions of dollars are squandered to fill the coffers of the fossil fuel executives and the weapons manufacturers. Um, you know, as the largest institutional consumer of fossil fuels, the military is an important client of oil and gas corporations. So it's a, no coincidence that these industries back politicians uh, uh, who, who push for more war and fund think tanks pushing for greater militarism. Um, just to give you one, uh, one aspect of how militarism impacts the climate, you know, just one U.S. military plane, the B-52 bomber, burns as much fuel in one hour as the average car driver uses in seven years. Um, a recent report by the Transnational Institute found that uh, the richest countries uh, spend 30 times as much on military spending as climate finance uh, for the world's most vulnerable countries. Seven of the top 10 uh, carbon polluting nations also rank among the top 10 military spenders. Uh, but this isn't just about uh, fuel and emissions and profits. Uh, there are few activities on earth as e ecologically destructive as war and militarism. You know, we came to the COP, uh, we bring our members from uh, military impacted communities to lift up the way that military has been impacted, uh, their environment and the climate. Um, in Albuquerque, a decades old uh, uh, jet fuel spill of over 24 million gallons, twice the size of the El uh, Exxon Valdez, you know, continues to migrate through the aquifer. In Guam, the U.S. military occupies a third of the island, destroying uh, sensitive ecosystems. Countless of bureau, a burial and cultural sites are inaccessible, damaged, or under threat. Um, uh, in Puerto Rico, in Vieques, uh, it's a site of decades-long bombing runs and testings of uh, chemical weapons from Vietnam to Iraq uh, have left ecological devastation. Uh, there's used ammunition storage, bombing, and war games that have continued on. And, uh, with the lease of, uh, of the toxic chemicals into the soil, into the water, into the air, the population suffers from dramatically uh, higher rates of cancer and other illnesses. You know, while the U.S. Navy has left the island of Vieques, you know, cancer remains there. When it comes to Palestine, uh, the U.S. diplomatic uh, cover and military support of Israeli occupying forces push for false greenwashing solutions uh, while simultaneously contributing to destruction of Palestinian land through the occupation. Um, since 9-11, training abroad has, uh, uh, training of police and military forces abroad has, was one of the many ways that war on terror measures um, uh, that changed the face of American policing. Uh, from the 1033 program that supplied local police with military surplus equipment and fusion centers, uh, they created a, uh, a nationwide domestic intelligence network. Under this banner of counterterrorism uh, counter training, officials traveled to Israel uh, to be trained at checkpoints, at settlements, and prisons, with the Secret Service, at airports. And we know that each of these sites, uh, uh, human rights groups have documented discrimination, repression, torture, and the killing of Palestinians. Um, Ramos, military could you please slow down? The translators, uh, interpreters are struggling. Apologies, I'm sorry. Thank I'll you. slow down. Thank you. I'll make sure to breathe between sentences. Um, uh, approximately $3.8 billion in U.S. military aid is allocated to Israel, that uh, a government that practices systemic discrimination and has, uh, uh, has maintained a military occupation of Palestine. The U.S. justifies and advances the global war on terror via its alliance with repressive states and its complicit, uh, particularly uh, in Palestine, on the repression of the Palestinian people. 
action is necessary to change the course of our government. And uh, there are actions that we can take when it comes to US funding of the occupation. You know, at the federal level, um, we need to build, invest, and divest campaigns that end US aid to the Israelis, uh, to Israel's uh, military industrial complex and to any other governments that, uh, that human rights uh, or their human rights violators. Um, you know, we can engage the, the, the lay law which prohibits the US government uh, from providing military assistance uh, to any foreign military unit where credible information exists that, the, that, the, that they've committed gross violation of human rights. And then at the state level, uh, we can fight uh, the expanding number of anti-BDS bills being passed in states around the country. This type of legislation uh, not only uh, harms the movement to end the Israeli occupation of Palestine, but is also a threat to the constitutional rights and free speech um, and protest. When it comes to the COP, uh, the impact of the military is, is absent in these international uh, climate conversations. Um, without having the military's impact on people, the environment, uh, and the climate addressed and mitigated, uh, you know, how can we expect uh, the Global South nations, those most impacted, uh, to engage uh, with these proceedings meaningfully? Um, you know, during COP26 in Scotland, uh, we lifted up this intersection between militarism and the climate crisis to make clear that uh, no solution to the climate crisis um, is compatible with a growing military. Um, and we saw that civil, civil society in Scotland was very um, supportive of this message. They, they understood that um, military missions had to be counted uh, when we're discussing, uh, you know, addressing climate change. Um, um, and it was interesting to see that uh, you had U.S. congressional delegations that were attending this international climate conversation, we're unaware that military missions were excluded from these conversations. You know, how can we have a genuine conversation about addressing climate change if the military is completely absent from this conversation? Um, you know, again, civil society is receptive to this message uh, because uh, they understand that there is no place in a world where militarism uh, 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 has not uh, only impacted their families and communities, but it can no longer continue to exist if we want to, uh, you know, inhabit a, a, a livable uh, planet. Um, even now, as people all over the world suffer record-breaking uh, climate devastation, the COP, uh, as I said, continues to be captured by the fossil fuel interests. Uh, fossil fuel corporations continue to profiteer off of false solutions like carbon offsets and trading, and 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 uh, uh, and while movements of impacted peoples from around the world are demanding real solutions. Um, you know, myself as part of GGJ and as part of the It Takes Roots frontline delegation to COP27 here, join the calls uh, um, of frontline impacted peoples across the world uh, for real climate solutions that center uh, human rights uh, and justice. Uh, we know that Egypt um, is one of the many countries supported with arms deals rather than with climate action. Egypt is much better known uh, for its uh, military spending than for the climate action that, 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 that takes place, right? The United States provides Egypt with $1.3 billion annually in military funding, uh, leading to Egypt having more M1, M1, A1 tanks than all countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America combined. The U.S. military aid to Egypt uh, over the last few years has, has shifted from uh, military line production towards uh, uh, and now towards high-tech border surveillance equipment and counterterrorism, um, you know the countries are, are because of the climate crisis are are beginning to develop this this ideology that uh, what's called the armed lifeboats, right? That as as climate impacted peoples begin to migrate, um, they're going to start closing off their borders and creating these these vessels where um, only the privileged and the and the rich uh, are able to reside in uh, you know in, in, in these countries, right? And like in the United States. Um, here in Egypt, there's over uh, 90,000 prisoners of conscience that are being held behind walls uh, uh, of an ever-expanding uh, prison industrial complex. The U.S. is the blueprint of how to build a large-scale carceral state. Uh, the U.S. has the largest per capita incarceration rate in the world by far. Um, and the U.S. has utilized uh, this weapon of the Patriot Act and the war on terror to repress any voices 
of descent, uh, be they Palestinian, be they Egyptian, be they Arab, be they Muslim, be they uh, black, brown, indigenous, right? Um, they repress environmental activists, human rights activists, uh, LGBT people and, and other vulnerable peoples from, um, and peoples of conscience. Um, learning here while being at the COP, um, uh, you, you see how the, uh, the US prison industrial complex and the Egyptian prison industrial complex mirror one another. You see some of the same tools um, um, that the United States utilized in the war on terror to build these super max facilities um, are being also constructed here. Uh, coming from a country that has uh, the largest prison system on the planet with 1.9 uh, million people behind bars, we echo uh, this call to free them all and to lift up the plight of tens of thousands of, of Egyptians surviving excruciating conditions and the millions more around the world. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think that with the COP ending in a few days, um, it'll be important uh, for the international movements around the world to keep an eye on what's happening here in Egypt, what's happening in, in Palestine, what's happening in, in, in these countries where um, um, we have to stay alert and we have to be attentive to what's happening because uh, um, it is these international systems that are working against us. And it's because they're working against us that it's, it's necessary for international solidarity uh, to, to be able to push back against, uh, against these systems. I think um, one thing to, to keep in mind here at the COP27 is that um, we, uh, we had an action around no war, no warming, around uh, 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 demilitarization and climate justice. And uh, one of our comrades uh, from the Arab Resource and Organizing Center, you know, you're not allowed to name and shame uh, countries um, here at the COP. You know, he raised the fact that he was Palestinian, that he came from Palestine, that he was from Gaza, um, and we were reprimanded for it. We were told that we were in the wrong, that we couldn't name those that are perpetrating violence against our communities. Um, so this is the type of environment that we're in. Um, it's a trade show. It's, uh, you know, they call it a plastic cops. It's not real. Um, it's uh, the real solutions lie with the people, not with these institutions and these multinational corporations. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave there and, 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 and wait for the second round. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramon. From Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. Now we would like to invite uh, to welcome Rafat Abu Ayesh uh, from Hirak al Naqab, occupied Palestine. He would like to talk about climate colonialism, water theft, Masafariyatta, Jordan Valley, and the role of the JNF. Assalamu alaikum, hello to everyone. Thank you so much for hosting me. And thank you so much for to stop the wall and to the hosters for hosting all of these amazing people. I'm learning so much about many struggles around the world and I'm seeing the quality of speakers. I hope I'm up to it. So thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll be starting by, by saying that I come from Al Naqab. That's the Southern part of Palestine. And it makes around 60% of the historical Palestinian area. People of, the people of Al Naqab will most of them, 90% of the people were kicked out or killed in, in the Nakba, as the same as all the Palestinian people everywhere uh, and what happened to them. Uh, the people who stayed are living today in less than 4.5% of their original lands. Today, occupation is, uh, occupation is fighting people on that 4.5% that they stayed on. And how are they doing that? They're doing that by, by the same methods you guys mentioned that are happening around the world. Uh, the frustration method that we will be addressing uh, and giving, um, I'm gonna be giving what I have on that, is one of the main uh, most dangerous methods used in Al-Naqab as a way to colonize and to take land of the people. Uh, the pine trees that are planted today in, in the land of al Naqab and the propaganda that's used by Israel around the world that they are making the desert green uh, is not actually true and these trees are not really doing good to the environment. Uh, we talk about that, we say that the, the desert of Palestine exists in al Naqab, but al Naqab is not all desert. So the, the land that is used by the JNF, the Jewish National Fund, which is one of the main enemies of the people and main enemies of Palestine, uh, and active, and is very active in Al-Naqab. Uh, the trees that are used by the JNF are not planted in a desert. This, the northern Al-Naqab, and that you can check, 
the northern Nakab is all agricultural area that has been that is being destroyed by the JNF using the pine trees that are European trees and have no connection to the land and are considered to be an invader species, which is preventing many of the original species of the land of trees in, in the Nakab to grow. And we are already losing trees and some of the animal uh, kinds that we have in Al-Naqab, we are already gone because of the changes in the environment. One, one important fact also is that the original trees of Al-Naqab, studies have shown that are helping, uh, because, because of the connection with the land, they are helping to keep the heat uh, or to lessen the heat that is on the air in Al-Naqab and to keep it on the ground. When the pine trees bring it back to the air, and I'll be addressing, I will be attaching some, some studies about that. And they are making uh, the environment even warm, warmer in the One other uh, main method of colonization in the Nakab that's used in the Nakab, and you have mentioned that, and that is killing the environment. And for us, and Badu as Bedouin, Palestinians from the southern Nakab, we have a great connection with the land, with the environment, and with the geography of the Nakab. And it's very, it's one of the main painful. Uh, scenes th that we see, and for us, it's very painful to see how the geography is changing and how the environment is is being killed by the industrial uh, uh, companies that Israel is giving them. And that's the Dead Sea in here. And the Dead Sea is one of the main facts. It does exist in Al-Naqab, uh, uh, in the southern Palestine. A big part of it is in here. Uh, we can see how much the Israelis are draining the sea and have already drained the sea. And one of the funny facts that I saw just to today in the morning, the, uh, the agreement between, between Jordan and Israel that was just uh, the promise that was just made today, uh, that they are sharing the intentions, the good intentions to keep the sea from uh, drying. When we know and we can see on the ground, and there are studies about that also, that it, the sea was drained in order to get, in order to get the salts by the, by the Israeli companies and by the international companies that, that get uh, the contracts to work in the Dead Sea. Uh, also, another another main example to show how much uh, the the occupation policies come to to kick the people out and to take Palestinian land and to take Palestinians out of their land is also uh, uh, giving to to the climate change that is happening. Is also the the, the factories of uh, Ramat Hovav, which is a very famous name here in al these are chemical factories that exist in, in agricultural and inhabited areas by Bedouins. The, next to the companies of uh, Ramat Hubab, next to the countries of, the, of Ramat Hubab, there are three unrecognized villages, and that's one important term to learn about in Al-Naqab. We have 37 unrecognized villages in Al-Naqab with more than 150,000 Palestinians who have Israeli citizenships who stayed after Nakba, living in these villages. They, these villages have no electricity, no water, are, and are, are not considered to be there. The Israelis do not see them. They see us as invisible because we live in this area and our original lands. For years, the chemical waste of Ramat Hubav was to be uh, thrown on the people of Wadi Naam. And for, for more than 30 years, 40 years, people have been suffering from uh, great diseases, from cancer, abortions, lots of, lots of cases. Uh, and there are will be addressed or, or will also be sharing reports on that. So uh, the main problems on the, that the Israelis don't see us. The main propaganda is that the Israelis are washing. If it comes to pink washing or green washing or, or any any way they can shoot, the Israelis can can use a method to show that they are doing anything good. They they would use that. I will give a funny example also. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop and then I might address, I might uh, uh, participate in the next uh, round. So, uh, okay. Uh, sorry, but just the chat is cutting me so much. Uh, because 36, 36 villages that are un unrecognized, they have no electricity and no water. The people of al Naqab came with a very creative, uh, they came with, with uh, a very creative method to having the services that they lack. So sol solar panels were used on a very wide scale for the first time in the area, in the unrecognized villages. These are a community of more than 150,000 people. 36 villages have been always living on solar panels. The only electricity they're having and it's sufficient for them is solar, solar panels. Some of these villages have the electricity, uh, the electricity company in them. The same village we mentioned 
which is called Wadi Nam, has an electricity station just next to that village, and the high voltage uh, pools go through that village, but they do not give people electricity in there. So after the success that the community did with solar panels, every house has solar panels, uh, the Israelis started using that into also greenwashing them. So they started creating solar panel farms uh, next to these villages. They use that also to show that they are uh, doing an eco-friendly project in, in al -Naqab. Uh, so, so they didn't give people electricity. They kept demolishing their houses, but they just stole the idea that they that they only used to get electricity, that the only way they had electricity for them. And thank you, and I'll be adding more due to questions. Thank you so much, Rafat. Now we would like to uh, start the second round. Thank you, Raya. Yeah, so we're running it, first of all, just some housekeeping. We're running a little bit long, but we do want to give everyone a chance to say a final word um, around the question of how do we struggle together? How do we interconnect and build campaigns and what do we need from each other? Each of you have shared such vital and powerful knowledge today about the interconnections between movements, about work that you're leading in your own communities. So I would love to just invite all of you to share a thought around where we go from here, how to stay connected moving forward. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we may run over a little bit and for those that are able to stay, we, we appreciate it so much. Um, and I'd like to invite Apurva first to, to share thoughts on that. Great, thanks everyone. And thanks for uh, these amazing uh, sort of uh, stories and information to move from here. Um, in conclusion, I just want to kind of quickly say that the task of uh, capital of, of an apartheid regime of all forms of oppression um, is to isolate people, is to isolate communities, is to isolate ourselves, alienate us from our society. And the answer to all of this is solidarity. We cannot underestimate the power of sharing our stories and struggles. And our experience in the BDS movement shows that this can be made concrete this sharing can be made concrete through campaigns um, that fight common enemies and where we make intersectionality um, not just an academic term, but a mode of engagement uh, and the way we uh, sort of build our movements. And this has been our lesson um, since the very beginning. Uh, in India, farmers uh, unions in India were the first to support the BDS call. And with them, we have been building um, the discourse and campaigns around NetFM and Israeli agribusiness, where we talk about um, uh, how Israeli companies that uh, colonize Palestinian lands and steal land and water um, force down false solutions to Indian farmers. Uh, Pegasus, the technology which is developed um, by surveilling, by using it, building it against Palestinians is being used against human rights defenders all over the world. That brings us together naturally. Our No Tech for Apartheid campaign, which is against Google and Amazon's uh, Project Nimbus, uh, brings together Palestinians and uh, solidarity groups, as well as tech workers with these companies and students and anti-war campaigners and digital rights campaigners as it affects all of them. Uh, so the multiplicity of campaigns um, and the small steps of shared victories is the biggest blow to this matrix of oppression that encompasses all of us and where um, we can see that these power structures are, are actually pretty small, the circle of uh, <laughs> leaders, uh, the global powers that sort of uh, are behind a lot of the issues that we've talked about. And I think it is uh, this coming together that that can be the most powerful way forward as it has been all along. I just want to end with a quick quote. Uh, you know, the writer Arutati Roy from India, I think everybody knows her, says, uh, another world is not only possible, she's on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. And I just want to very humbly, not being a writer, <laughs> add that uh, the steps on this way are actually paved by solidarities and, and shared struggles. And, and this lesson, um, you know, uh, empowers us in the BDS movement. And I think in all the struggles that we are part of. So thanks everyone. And uh, of course, we will be together in struggles uh, from here on as well. Apurva, thank you so much. I love that quote. It's one of my favorites as well. Um, Elena? Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree with what was said uh, just before, and uh, <clears throat> I also second uh, 
um, the activists who said that uh, this is all part of one uh, of one struggle. Uh, I think the challenge is to put it into practice, uh, like to really practice this uh, solidarity and to really find ways of uh, supporting each other and uh, um, including uh, in the uh, messages that we are using and in the type of uh, uh, campaigns and actions that we are uh, carrying on, uh, also the demands from, uh, from others. So to really um, start to practice this, um, this solidarity. Uh, I was sharing before in the chat a couple of reports where we were um, <clears throat> already looking into all the big corporations uh, that are part of this uh, expansion of gas in this Mediterranean. And it's true that the oil and gas industry is totally interconnected with uh, the uh, military industry. And, uh, but it's also being used uh, in, um, uh, let's say, a more uh, political way. Like uh, right now, the language that is being used by many uh, uh, governments and uh, institutions in Europe uh, around uh, the state of emergency that we are living is uh, a language that basically allow to bypass uh, um, environmental laws, uh, uh, but also human rights uh, concerns. And maybe this is uh, something that we should not uh, allow to happen. Uh, it is the case uh, for sure of East Mediterranean, but it's also the case of many other places where oil and gas uh, are still being extracted, like oil is still part of our present, is not uh, part of our past, unfortunately, and uh, gas is more and more um, relevant in the, in the agenda of uh, uh, Euro European governments. So I think it's up to us to expose uh, uh, this type of uh, connections, but it's also up to us to um, practice uh, a climate justice uh, perspective in um, each of our uh, campaigns, but also uh, to keep uh, human rights uh, up front. So it's really uh, like this hypocrisy from institutions should be exposed, but also corporations should be exposed for being part of, uh, of this type of uh, agenda. I know the BDS uh, <clears throat> campaign has already launched um, a campaign against uh, Chevron and Siemens as uh, two of the corporations that are um, active in the extraction of the Leviathan uh, and Tamar gas fields. Uh, there are many more, like uh, I was saying before, uh, the Italian uh, corporation um, Eni is uh, a key actor uh, in Cyprus, in Egypt, and now also in the new, uh, the gas fields that will be explored uh, uh, that were contended between Lebanon and, um, and Israel. Uh, gas transport system operators, like companies that are just uh, managing the gas infrastructure, they also have a key role. The Italian uh, gas transport system operator, for instance, controls 25% uh, of uh, the company that manages the Arish Ashkelon pipeline. So as we just need to look for this type of connections and then we need to uh, mainstream them in the, in the narrative for, uh, for our campaigns. So thank you so much again. Thank you, Elena. Thank you so much for sharing all of that information. Uh, Ramon, if you're still with us, there you are. Yes. Um, uh, the solutions that we uh, seek, you know, they must, the solutions must protect, not harm our communities. Uh, the solutions must repair past and present harms. Um, and the solutions must provide a uh, foundation to transform relationships and structures so that they are rooted in respect, equity, and justice. Uh, you know, we must invest in the solutions that protect our communities today while building the world we want to live in tomorrow and beyond. Um, you know, uh, how do we do that? Uh, it's about being in right relationship with both people and the planet. You know, what is our role? Uh, I'm speaking for myself and people that live inside, uh, you know, on Turtle Island that live inside the belly of the beast. You know, what is, what is our role? 
um, in order to confront this um, monster of militarism. You know, we must seek leadership from diaspora communities. We must have internationalist and solidarity and cooperation. And uh, we must have a collective repertoire, uh, repertory approach to uh, foreign policy. It's not enough that we uh, ask that we reduce and redress the harms perpetrated by the US uh, foreign policy, but we must center an interse intersectional principles of collective care, of reparations, of right relationship and, and accountability. Um, you know, uh, militarism impacts us all, whether you're uh, addressing food sovereignty, housing justice, uh, immigrant rights, um, you know, uh, uh, all, all these, in, all these uh, struggles impact, uh, impact us all, like the military impacts us all, right? So, um, you know, uh, we have to support one another. We have to not work in uh, silos, but actually continue to build these bridges, um, and, you know, and just to kind of uh, end with uh, uh, a few words as far as like, um, you know, appreciate uh, for being uh, to be allowed in this space, and uh, you know the you know while the, these governments and these corporations try to uh, dim our light, you know it, it's us who will awaken the dawn. Um, so appreciate uh, to sharing this space with all these amazing people. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you so much for being here. And, uh, safe travels back to Turtle Island after the conference. Anna, if you're still with us. Hello. Yes, I'm still here. I share what everyone before me said. In these responses, what, what do we do now? This space is a good start. It's a great start because it allows us to share what is happening in each territory. And it has shown that it is one struggle, like one activist said. I also think it's important to have campaigns to share information about what is happening. Just like there are walls of cement, there are walls created by hegemonic media, which are financed by governments and companies, and which will always show the positive side or the way in which these companies are washing the faces of these extractivist companies. So the assembly of El Garrobo thinks it's important to to surpass this media barrier to get to people and to and to communities and speak about what is happening in Argentina with Mecrot, it's very necessary to share information about this agreement and the impact it can have on on people and environment what this agreement doesn't say is that the, there's a plan to create rations of water in the consumption of water to divert a large part of this common good to corporations laws that protect water, that control access to water, and there's a modification of mechanisms from the state that control the consumption of water. But I think it's necessary to work together against this media barrier and this large wall created by uh, information media. It's very important to organize collectively, and I'm very grateful to this for the space. Like one colleague said, it's necessary to build bridges and to sustain those bridges and organize campaigns that bring together these struggles and show who is responsible. And that in that way, unmask companies and governments, show them for who them. So um, I send you hugs and thanks for this space. Anna hugs back. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to uplift something from the chat that um, 
Andres shared to there's a digital action tomorrow with Fridays for the Future um, to highlight Ala Abdel Fatah on his birthday. So check that out. We'll drop a link in the chat to their website. Um, and I would like to invite Rashan. Final comments? Hi, thanks. I mean, what everyone else has said already um, really does sum it up. So just very, very briefly, I wanted to thank Stop the Wall and Visualizing Palestine, because I think this webinar is itself an example of how we need to know we're not alone and that we have comrades all over the world so that when we hear of farmer strikes in India, campaigns being successful against Makarot in Latin America, it gives us inspiration all the way down here in South Africa. So I think that in itself is something that builds solidarity and boosts our, our morale and gives us inspiration to continue the struggles that we're all involved in. Um, obviously sharing experiences of what worked, but also what hasn't worked in our campaigns, uh, sharing campaign tools and information and visualizing Palestine is a brilliant tool for this. But importantly, I think what Apuva was saying about intersectionality and action, which you know really is the hard work of building links between struggles, between climate justice, food sovereignty, water commons, human rights, and Palestine solidarity. Because I think the biggest weapon we have confronting the militarism um, of our neoliberal world order is BDS. If we can implement BDS, if we can take up, as was said before, expose and then take action and take action coordinatedly across, across the world, adding our voices to campaigns around the world, wherever we see Israeli apartheid greenwashing, then I think we will be successful in our solidarity with the Palestinian struggle, which is key to us achieving any kind of victory in all the rest of the work that we're doing. And it's just been really great to be part of this panel. So thank you once again. Thank you, Roshan. Thank you so much for your powerful words. Monica? Yes, I hope you can hear me. Uh, well, thanks a lot uh, uh, for all the content shared here. I, I've learned a lot. And also, I think they show the different uh, facets of the apartheid regime and the possibilities at the same time uh, to build solidarity. No? Uh, regarding agribusiness, like I would just say that I think there is a, a need to follow up and monitor uh, the best known companies as Metafin, for example. And for that, I would really recommend the work developed by the solidarity organizations with Palestine in India, for example, or in Tunisia, no? which are working on Metafin. Uh, at the same time, I think it's important to remind that very few people have likely heard on the LR group or Vitrelli group or Afimilk or Green 2000. And those, those companies are, are very active now. And uh, for example, we just paste now the, some news on uh, in the chat on, uh, on uh, Agricultiva, which is a subsidiary of the Mitrelli group, which is now announcing uh, an Agropol West project in Senegal. Uh, including training centers that are, I suppose, uh, I didn't work on that yet for the moment, but very close to the excellency centers that Apova was uh, talking about. Or two days ago, uh, the Mitrelli group met the um, ambassadors to Israel from Ethiopia, Rwanda, Morocco, Angola, and the Guinea Equatorial uh, also. No? So, I mean, they are very active. They are building those projects now. So I think it's very important to to, uh, to see them as key actors in the Israel's foreign agenda. I think it's critical to monitor them uh, and the activities, no? And not only to protect the interests of the people and the communities in the global South, but also to build the solidarity with the struggle of Palestinians against the Israeli apartheid, no? So I would say that in both cases for us, Israeli business is a threat, no? To the fight for food sovereignty that peace and organizations are leading in Palestine and also around the world. Thanks a lot. Monica, thank you so much. And so we are, this brings us to our last word of the day, Rafat. Uh, so yeah, if we're speaking about action, I would just say that from, from the ground, from inside Palestine and, uh, and inside the occupied areas of Palestine in the 48, the main thing that we always ask of groups and solidarity groups is to connect and to help us mobilize together. Something that we can do on the ground is 
mobilizing together and protesting together. Every time we have a great challenge inside Palestine and we try to move countries around the world. We had a great example uh, in 2013 and in the past events also, but, but mostly in 2013 when we are fighting against the proverb plan that was a proverb to, to confiscate more than a thousand dunams from the Bedouin community, the Bedouin Palestinian community in, in the Southern Palestine, Southern occupied Palestine. Uh, in the same day, we had 58 countries protesting with us. This stands for Palestine, these protests around the world that you see far and you see that maybe they, are, they do not have uh, uh, the great impact you would, would think. For us here, they do help uh, the communication and the pressure from outside, uh, abroad and on the ground is, is helping so much for us uh, to mobilize in here also and to make a great effect. So we want you to join every activity that you find for Palestine, to pay attention and to make connections with, with the organizations. You have many today, many pages on Instagram and on Facebook. We need that and that can help. And thank you. Rafat, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. We are truly grateful for all of your interventions, for your tremendous knowledge and the work that you've put into your own communities and to building connections across movements, across communities. We're so grateful for our interpreters today, especially going long, um, such a challenging role. And, and we're really grateful for helping make this accessible to as many people as possible and to our co-sponsors and for all the attendees from all over the world that you've stayed long with us. It just shows how vital and important this topic is. So thank you so much and wishing you an amazing morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Raya, any final words from your side? Uh, thank you so much. I would like to thank all the speakers and I would just want to say that I'm sending all the, I'm filling all the uh, calls and campaigns that you can join for your next action. Like, let's say, let's take an action. So please um, find the, the shared, uh, uh, calls in the chat. Thank you so much.